How are we doing, Severin? Amen. Get excited. Get excited. It's good to be back. Uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time and the first time in a long time, we got a little bit of catching up to do. I got a little bit of news. As of 629 in the AM, New Year's Eve, I got me a daughter. Scarlett Kathleen Cox. Scarlett Kathleen, mom and baby are doing well. She arrived on the scene, five pounds and 12 ounces, refuses to sleep at night. I want to see a little more spiritual fruit in her life in that area, so you can pray about that. I'm about ha half awake uh, at the moment, but hopefully that's all it takes. The other thing I want to say before I get going, um, as, a, as, as a pastor of, of a church, it's a, it's, a, it's a horrible thing when you stand you know, on this stage and, um, and you know that there's nobody that you can trust, nobody that you can delegate things to. Um, and fortunately, by God's grace, I don't know what that's like. I don't know what it's like to be alone in ministry. I don't know what it's like to not have people around me uh, that I can lean on. Because for the last three weeks, I, um, I had Mark and Aaron teach behind me. And I knew when I assigned those guys uh, the, the awesome responsibility and privilege that opening and preaching the Word of God is, I knew that they would open the text. I knew they'd let the Bible speak for itself and they'd get to the gospel. And that's exactly what they did. So if we could, let's give it up for them. Appreciate that. And today, I am very pleased to announce we are starting a brand new series out of the old book of Haggai. Classic Haggai series coming your way for the next three weeks. By show of hands, let's do it. It's going to be that kind, of, that kind of sermon. Who here, you better be honest, who here has heard, I'm not talking about like a text reference, who here has heard an entire sermon preached out of the book of Haggai before? Amen. Like, like one and a half people. Hey, the, the sound... The AV guy up top just raised his hand because he heard one at the early service. I like, see, I appreciate, I appreciate preaching out of a book like that because that just means you can really mess it up and nobody knows the difference. Pressure's off. Praise God. Praise God for that. Uh, Haggai is, is one of the minor prophets uh, of which there's 12 toward the latter end of the Old Testament, and it's 38 verses long. 38 verses long, but, but Haggai, pound for pound, is he's deadly. He's destructive. He's convicting. He's surgical. Uh, the way that God spoke through him. And in the story of Haggai, what we're going to read is about a man named Haggai that God rose up to speak on behalf of his people. And really what God did through Haggai is he showed his people Israel how to have a fresh start. That's what Haggai is about. He, he's literally speaking through Haggai to explain to his people Israel how to start your life over, how to rebuild, and how to avoid the same mistakes and consequences that have been plaguing you for who knows how long. And uh, I find it a really appropriate time to do this at the beginning of the year because, um, you know, around the new year, people are looking for a fresh start. And there's one reason for that, and there's only one reason for that, because you did some dumb things the last 365 days. Amen? Amen. Yeah, we can be honest in the house of God. I'm no different. I've done some dumb things. I mean, no. So uh, around this time of year, people are looking for a fresh start. You know, you, you kind of introspect a little bit. It, it's just interesting. Nobody has like a spring resolution or a winter resolution. You have a New Year's resolution because you, you look back on life and you think, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do things different. I'm going to do things right. And that's what Haggai's about. Really, it's a, it's a book that shows us how to redo our lives, to rebuild our lives, and to make 2016 the best year of our life. But let me say this before I go any further. This is not going to be my most popular sermon. I do not expect to win any popularity contest, but I heard a pastor say this that I admire um, as much as I can one time. He was telling a story, and he said that a lady came up to him in his church and said, she said, Pastor, you know, a lot of times um, when I go to other churches, I leave feeling really uplifted, and I leave feeling really encouraged, and I leave feeling really good about myself. And then she said, and I don't always feel like that at your church. Why is that? And he held up this book, and he said, because we preach the whole thing. And just, just so we're clear, you know, if you're here for the first time, first time in a long time, or you're kind of deciding whether or not severance for you, I just want to make this real clear. When the text that we look at on a Sunday morning is a hard, painful, sobering text, I promise you the message is going to be hard, painful, and sobering. When it's uplifting, it'll be an uplifting message. But today is going to be, um, it might be a come to Jesus moment for a couple of people because as I was studying this text, it certainly was a come to Jesus moment for me. And so it'll be hard, but it'll be healthy. Amen? All right, we're in Haggai chapter 1, starting in verse 1, and it says, In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, 
the high priest. Let me pause there. The interesting thing about this right out the gate is that it's time stamped. It's time stamped the second year of King Darius, the first day of the sixth month. And we know from extra biblical records the exact date in history that this took place, which was August 29th, the year 520 BC, 520 years before Jesus arrived on scene. And if you're going to get the message of Haggai, if it's going to hit you, first thing we've got to get is context. And a whole lot has gone on in the people of Israel. Israel is the nation through whom God is dealing with here. It's the nation through whom he primarily dealt with in the Old Testament. And God created Israel kind of almost out of nothing, out of a man that shouldn't have been able to have kids, Abraham. He, he delivered that nation from Egypt. He brought them through the wilderness and into the promised land. And once Israel got into the promised land, they did what absolutely everybody has the tendency to do. They got real comfortable, they got real secure, and they completely forgot about the God that gave them those things. So one of the first things they do once they get into the promised land is they start saying, you know, hey, we're looking around at the, the surrounding nations and we want a king that sits on a physical throne. All right, they kind of felt like, you know, the loser at the lunch table. They want to be like the cool kids in high school. Everybody else has a king, so they say, we want a king. And God basically tells them that that's not, that's not going to be, um, it, it's, really, it's, it's really not going to give them everything that they think it's going to give them. And there's going to be some consequences associated with that. They said, that's what we want. We want to be like everybody else. And God, like, uh, like really any parent would do, decides, all right, I'll, I'll let you have what you want. I'll let you feel the, the weight of your own decisions. And so God gave them a king, very first king of Israel, was King Saul. And we know two things about King Saul from the Bible. Number one, he was a looker. The Bible tells us he was a good-looking dude. And number two, oddly enough, the Bible goes out of its way to mention how tall Saul was, which I always thought was interesting. And almost immediately into the reign of King Saul, we find a universal principle, uh, which is, of course, you can't trust tall people, okay? What you need is a, is a nice, short leader, around about, I'd say, roughly 5'8", five, 5'9". Five, Any taller than that, I don't know. I, I, I can't vouch for him. So, so King Saul basically goes nuts like lunatic, uh, within like 30 seconds of him reigning, and, and, and so the mantles pass from him. And then another man is appointed king, that's King David. King David was a king during like the golden age of Israel, like universally almost celebrated as the greatest king in Israel's history, and it's only for one reason, and it's only for one reason. It's because the Bible gives David the unimaginable honor of calling him a man after God's own heart. Think about that. Think about what it's like to be remembered in God's word that way. The, 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 uh, the cool thing about um, you know, David's namesake there is that it wasn't because he lived the perfect life that he was a man after God's own heart. David was an adulterer at times. He was a murderer at times, but still God had room in his kingdom for a sinner like him, which gives a whole lot of hope for me and no doubt you as well. Amen? So David had a heart for God. He wanted to build God a temple. And God said, uh, you know, David, I love you, but you're a warrior. You got blood on your hands up to your elbows. That's not your job. And you're going to have a son named Solomon. He's going to sit on the throne after you. He'll build my temple. And that's what David's son Solomon did. So Solomon, you know, spares no expense with this temple. He designs it in a way that's in keeping with God's glory. It was one of the wonders of the ancient world, and people came for miles to see this thing. If you don't understand the significance of the temple, then you're not really going to get the message of Haggai um, really, the, the fundamental reason why the temple was such a big deal is because the temple was the structure that actually housed the spirit of the living God. It, the Bible said that the, that the presence of God would manifest itself there and rest and dwell there. See, we live in, in what you could call the church age or the New Testament era, era. And in that era, the Bible says that because Jesus Christ, through his life, death, and, death and resurrection, for all of us who call on his name, what happens is our sin is taken away and Jesus' righteousness clothes us so much so that we can actually, uh, the, the Spirit of God can actually dwell with us because of, of what Jesus has done, which is incredible. So the New Testament tells us that we, people who have a relationship with Jesus Christ, are actually the temple of the Holy Ghost. It wasn't always that way. It wasn't that way in the Old Testament. God couldn't just dwell with people when they were, you know, their sin hadn't been dealt with. So he would dwell in this temple. And, and so not only was the temple where God would dwell, where his presence would, 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 would reside, but the temple was necessary if you were going to honor and serve God the way that he prescribed. There's a number of things that God mandated in the Old Testament that he said, I want you to do this to serve me and worship me. And all of it necessitated a temple. So you take the temple away and you really couldn't honor and worship God the way that you needed to. So years after Solomon builds this temple, Israel sets a trajectory for itself uh, and it keeps going farther and farther uh, away from God, and sure enough, they start, you know, intermingling with surrounding cultures, which meant that inevitably they're, they're adopting foreign gods and foreign practices. 
Pretty soon the Bible records they're sacrificing their children to foreign gods. Disgusting. And so God looks down on that. He's, he's not a God that sweeps sin under the rug. He's not a God that takes sin lightly. And so God really decided, all right, if you think a life outside of me is that much of a good idea, then I'll let you feel the weight of your decisions. I'll let you feel the weight of your actions. And so God basically removed his hand of blessing because he wasn't going to bless that behavior. So, so the nation of Israel, where it once was unified, it splits north from south and has a civil war. And the north is actually very quickly just annihilated by a foreign nation, brought into captivity and completely done away with. Years later, the, the, the same thing was beginning to happen to the southern half, which was Judah. And there was a world power of the day, Babylon. It rode into Judah and it conquered the southern half of Israel. And when it did so, it did the unthinkable, like the absolute worst thing that could have happened happened to Israel. They destroyed the temple. Now, now to destroy the temple, like I said, what this meant is that God's presence no longer had a place to dwell with and, and, and among his people. And further, the Israelites couldn't worship and serve God anymore the way that he commanded them to. And if that wasn't bad enough, losing their temple, the Babylonians actually captured the Israelites and brought them into exile. So this is like, it, it's the picture of, a, of an addict hitting rock bottom. It's basically what happens. God just says, hey, I'm going to let you lose everything so that maybe you'll get it. So they're, they're brought into exile. They stay there for a number of years. But God, in his mercy, raises up another world power, Persia, uh, under the rule of a king Cyrus. Cyrus rolls on Babylon, destroys them, inherits all of these Israelite slaves. And when he does, he does something unbelievable. He lets the slaves return to the land. Now, this is, like an un this is hitting the lottery for these Israelite slaves. It's unthinkable that a ruler, you know, a, a dictator, a tyrant in that day would be that kind to his subjects, but, but basically this was God's way of delivering them and allowing them to have a fresh start. This is like the new year for the Israelites. So, so here's what you're thinking after, after Israel has been through all this. Right? They have the benefit of history. They have the benefit of looking at the mistakes of their fathers and saying, okay, we're gonna walk a different uh, kind of walk. We're gonna live a different kind of life. We're gonna learn from the mistakes of the past. Because it doesn't take a PhD to analyze the life of Israel and say every single time they didn't make God a priority, things fell apart for them. Every single time. But every single time they repented and they got back to him and they made the main thing the main thing, you know, things went well for them. So you'd think getting back into the land meant, okay, first things first, they're going to build this temple so God's presence has a, sp uh, has a place to dwell. And then they, they're going to be able to worship and serve and honor God the way that they should. That's the first thing they should attend to, but that's not what we see in the book of Haggai. In verse 2 we read, the Lord of hosts says this, these people say, the time has not come for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. Verse 3, the word of the Lord came through Haggai the prophet. Is it a time for you yourselves to live in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? At the time of Haggai saying those words, the Israelites had been back in the land for 16 years. 16 years they had an opportunity to get things right, and they just, for whatever reason, didn't. And so what you're dealing with, and this is the whole occasion for the book of Haggai, you're dealing with a people who consistently, stubbornly refuse to make God the center of their lives and focus on their relationship with their God as their main priority. Now, th the first thing that I thought when I was reading that was, that, first off, it's crazy. It's crazy that Israel wouldn't finally understand that things just go better for them when they prioritize God. So I'm asking the question, why on earth wouldn't they prioritize God? They've lost everything. They've paid the ultimate price. They have a chance to restart. Why, what, what, are they, what do they believe is a good reason to not do this? And I, I read around, I did some research, and I found there's basically two reasons you can boil the whole thing down to. You can read in the book of Ezra about the story of these exiles returning from Babylon in their first years in the land. And what you read is when they first got there, just like people tend to do, they hit the ground running. And they did have their priorities in line, and they were doing everything uh, the way that they should. The Bible says that they laid the foundation of the temple. They were making progress. Like they were moving exactly the way God would call them to move. But then it didn't become, it, it stopped being easy for them. It's basically the first reason. It wasn't easy. The Bible says that there were, there were foreigners in the land, Samaritans, and they came and, and sort of opposed them. They threatened them. They intimidated them. They started bribing religious officials to make it their job, to basically uh, make it difficult for the Jews to keep rebuilding. And they went so far as to send a decree all the way back to Persia. And they said, hey, 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 ruler of Persia, these Jews are rebuilding the temple. I just want to let you know this is what they do historically. They're going to build, they're going to build this temple. Then they're going to stop paying taxes to you. And they're going to revolt against you. They have a history of doing so. I just thought you should know. 
So when word of that got to the Persian emperor, uh, he sends a delegation back to Israel, and he basically forces the Jewish people to stop building this temple. And here it is 16 years later, and they haven't started again because it wasn't easy. There were obstacles, there was opposition, all that stuff. The second reason is, is very simply because it wasn't practical. It just wasn't practical to build this temple right now. See, building a temple wasn't like building a house. It, it wasn't like a barn raising. All right? It wasn't a couple of families got together and decided to knock that out one weekend. Right, just to give you an example, when Solomon built the first temple, it took him seven years. And the nation of Israel was in, it had a much more robust labor force. There was many, uh, you know, a whole lot more hands on deck uh, to build that thing. And so it took them seven years. It was going to take these people uh, probably even longer than that if they wanted to do it the right way. It's not the sort of thing, it basically required all of you if you were going to do it. Secondly, it, it was economically a very challenging thing because, you know, the temple was overlaid with gold, silver, precious stones, gems, all that kind of stuff. And what we know during the time of Haggai is that all of the people were experiencing an economic recession, the likes of which a lot of them hadn't seen before. Right, their harvests aren't really producing the way that they thought. They're not really seeing return uh, for, for all of their work ethic. They're having trouble putting food on their table, feeding their own families. And so God even says there, and he, and he gives them the indictment in verse 3 and 4, you're focused on your own houses. You're focused on decorating your own homes. Meanwhile, my house lies in ruins. So the two reasons that the Israelites did not get this thing done for 16 years now is, number one, it's not easy. Number two, it's not practical. So basically, Israel just had other things going on. But here's what I found interesting about this. In verse 2, when you read carefully what God's issue is here, he says, these people say the time has not come for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. Think real carefully. Read real carefully what God says there. The problem in Israel was not that they were outright saying, we don't care about God anymore. We don't care about Yahweh. It's never done us any good to serve him, so we're just done. We're not going you know, to be a God-honoring nation anymore. That's not what Israel was saying. I, I found this in every commentary I read. If you ask the people of Israel in this day what their stance was toward God, all of them would have agreed, hey, building the temple is a great idea. Prioritizing God is a great idea. Focusing on our relationship with God is a great idea. I just can't do it right now because i got a lot going on in my life. What they were saying, and it's important to understand this. Is, you see, when I read that God had an issue with something, the most important thing for me is that I understand what that issue is so I don't do it. God's issue was not that these people were saying flat out no to God. His issue was that they're saying not now because they had other things going on. That's what the entire book of Haggai, that mindset, that singular mindset is what the entire book of Haggai is written to address. And God basically begins this letter by saying, don't you dare think for a second that it's okay to allow anything to come before me in your life. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give us three ideas, three ideas in this teaching if we have some desire to rebuild our lives, if we have some desire to see 2016 be better than 2015 was, three ideas that are non-negotiables and the first one is this. There will absolutely always be a reason to put God on hold, but the one thing that there will never be is a good reason. There will always be a reason to put God on hold. There just, there's just never going to be a good reason. What I found so convicting about this text when I read it and when I understood what God's actually saying here is that nine times out of ten I hear this from people who claim to be followers of Jesus, and I've heard this more times than I can count come out of my own mouth where we use all the same excuses that the Israelites were using and we for some reason think that they're valid when they come from us. It's, just think about this for a minute. I mean, think about how many times you knew what God was calling you to do, but you couldn't do it right now because there's obstacles, because there's opposition, because there's resistance. That's exactly what the Israelites were saying. And the Israelites had people rolling up on them with weapons saying, we're going to kill you if you continue to build this thing. And God still didn't honor that as a valid excuse. Or, or, you know, we'll say, you know, I, I'd, love to, I'd love to invest a little bit more of my time, a little bit more of my energy, a little bit more of my resources into what I know God's calling me to. I just, I can't right now. I got a lot of things going on in the home. Yeah, I got the kids are locked up in sports. I got a lot of, you know, I got bills to pay myself. I got renovations I need to make. That is exactly the mindset that the Israelites had. And it's no more valid for them than it will be for us when we try to use it. You know, I, I, was, I was putting this teaching together and I was asking myself, like, what if, we, what if we applied the logic that we apply to God to any other relationship in our lives? Like, what if, what, if, what if I treated my wife, my marriage, think about this for a second, the way we're so inclined to treat God so many times? See, because the MO for a lot of us, if we're being real honest, is we'll, we'll give to God when we literally have nothing else 
going on in our lives. And I thought, what if that's how I treated my wife? Like, what if that's what my marriage was marked by? What if my, what if my game plan was, babe, I'll, I'll take you out on dates, I'll invest in you, I'll spend time with you, I'll demonstrate how much I care about you when I literally have nothing else competing for my time, energy, and attention. How, how long do you think that union would last? I hope nobody got that advice in marriage counseling because you'll be in divorce court pretty soon if you did. You see, my wife is honored when I refuse to take a phone call, when I refuse to respond to an email, when I refuse to hold a meeting, when I say no to something that's competing for my time because of her. That's when, that's when my wife is honored. That's when my wife feels loved. When despite everything going on, my life, going on in my life, I say, hey, I made vows to you, I made you a promise, and I will honor that commitment come hell or high water. And it's absolutely, it should be absolutely no different in our relationship with God. Whatever we find to be a valid excuse in our life for kind of putting God on the shelf or sidelining God right now, I'm just, I'm telling you from the book of Haggai, it's not my words, it's his. Whatever that excuse is, it's not a good one, not in God's eyes. There's no such thing as one. And let, me, let me just walk through applications here and, and, and let this get a whole lot more uncomfortable because I, I like doing that. <laughs> um, hey, if you're in a relationship right now that you know point blank you might be able to justify to other people, but you know you have absolutely no business in. If you're, man, if you're engaged in activity right now, that you know as a follower of Jesus, as somebody who claims to care about your walk with God, and your game plan is, I know I shouldn't be doing that, but you're thinking, I'll just deal with it later, based on the book of Haggai, I would challenge you to think again. I mean, if, if, if you got sin, if you got something going on in your life that you haven't really brought to the light, you haven't really talked to anybody about because you thought it was manageable for a time, but you've been playing with fire, now it's, it, it's burning you, it's taking root in your life, and your game plan is, I'll deal with that later. I, you know, I, I don't want to do that right now. I'll confess that to a brother or sister later. I'll start holding myself accountable later. I'll deal with this on my time because there's reasons not to do it right now. Please, literally, for the love of God, think again. Right, if you feel God calling you to do anything that God would call you to do, maybe you look around and you see this church growing. You see that there's a need for volunteers and you feel like you're called to put this church on your back so that we can do what we need to do, be what we need to be, reach the people that we're called to reach. But your thought is, that'd be a good time when, when things die down in my life. I'm just telling you, that's not a valid excuse. It's not a valid excuse for me. It's not a valid excuse for any of us, not based on the book of Haggai. And before I go any further in this teaching, let me just make this remarkably clear. Far be it for Ryan Cox to stand on a stage and pretend like I'm teaching this as though I have it nailed down. Absolutely not. If you, if you hear this as though I'm preaching at you, believe me when I say I'm preaching this to all of us. I've been sitting on this text for about 10 days and it's felt like a nuclear bomb going off inside of me. It's felt like surgery where God's shown me every area of my life that I'm, I'm just consistently putting him on the shelf and consistently telling him right now and I've had to repent of it and repent of it and repent of it. This is not something I have nailed down and I'm taking it as seriously as I'm asking you to take it. But let me, let me tell you what some of my goals are for 2016. And you can plug this in. I'm sure you got some of your own. This year, I want to be a better husband to my wife than I was in 2015. Any other husbands here agree with that? Anybody, any other husbands want to see that in your marriage? I want to be a better example to two young kids now. I got two young kids looking up to me as the primary influencer in their life. That is horrifying. That is humbling to the core to me. I, like I think about my son Everett, and I know this, I know this, as much as I would like this to not be the case, based on what I do or don't do and demonstrate to my son, based on my activity or inactivity, I am teaching him what kind of man he should grow up to be. Whether I like that or not, that's just what fatherhood is, amen? And, and as far as my daughter goes, Scarlett, I am showing her the kind of man that she should grow up to find. That's how much rides on the life that I decide to live. So I really want to be a better example to those two kids this year than I was last year. And, and, and finally, I want to be a better pastor of this church this year than I was last year. And I might not have everything about life figured out yet, but I know this. Not one of those goals or any of the goals that you have mapped out gets realized until we deal with the absolutely ridiculous mindset that it's okay to put on hold the God that upholds the universe by the word of his power. Point blank, you wanna see growth in your life, you wanna see maturity, you wanna see depth 
in your life, if this does not shape your reality, then none of your goals, none of your goals will be realized. It just doesn't happen outside of God. And what I found so interesting about Haggai, this, this, this prophet, for as short as his ministry was, he has one of the, the recorded most successful ministries of any prophet in the entire word of God. And that makes me sit up and take note of what he said and why he said it. And I think about the nation of Israel during this time, and the reality is you could have played whack-a-mole with the problems that this nation had. Economically, socially, military, whatever it was, they had problems like the colonel's got chicken. God could have addressed anything, okay? But this is what he chose to begin with. He didn't give them a checklist of things to stop doing or a, a number of things to start doing. He addressed a mindset. And the Bible says that we're transformed not by the renewing of our hands, not the, by, by the renewing of our action. We're transformed as a people by the renewing of our minds because a broken mindset will lead to broken actions, will lead to a broken lifestyle. You correct the mindset, you can correct the man, amen? So God begins by saying, in case you think it's okay to claim that you care at all about God, in case you think it's okay to claim to be a disciple of Jesus Christ and to have the audacity to put on hold the God to whom you owe your next breath, I just want to make this clear. Until that's dealt with, nothing in your life is going to get better. There's going to be no growth. If there was any wiggle room there, I would offer it to you as a preacher. But, but let me say this. I said this to somebody after the first service. I hope if my son grows up and attends a church that isn't mine, I hope he's got a pastor that's got the courage to tell him that. So maybe you hear this and you've already shut me out. Amen. I'm sure that there's people in the room that have said, hey, this is my life. I don't know who this preacher thinks he is, but he's not, you know, I'm not, I don't accept that. You know, this is my life. I got to do me. Hey, I can't do anything about that. But I'll tell you what happened to me when I read this. It convicted me to the core. It laid me open and it made me think this is exactly what I needed to hear to start my year off. And here's what I've seen demonstrated time after time as a preacher. Whenever a message literally pierces me, God always has a way of bringing the right people here that needed to hear it as much as I do. And so if that's you and you legitimately want to dig into God, be pleasing to God, have a better year this year than you did last year, then you're probably asking the question I was asking, hey, how do I know if I've messed this up? Because it's not like God told us to build a temple and there's a pile of rubble in our backyard. So how do you know if you're off here? The next verses that God gives us is a litmus test to tell us, how it, to tell us whether or not we're off here. And I'll, I'll make a bold statement. If anything that I'm about to read describes you, take it as a sign of God telling you that you've gone off in some area of your life. And I, I, in the first service, people cried as I read these words. I guarantee you. God has brought people here right now that needed to hear these words. And as I read them, the only thing you're going to be faced with is that is me. That is me all over. Verse 5 says, now the Lord of hosts says this, think carefully about your ways. Man, that is something that some people go their entire lives without ever doing. Because we live in a world that's increasingly more fast-paced. We live in a world that never shuts up. We live in a world that everything is always placing some demand on our time. We live in a world where we always got to get to the next thing, and we can distract ourselves for decades without ever doing what God just asked Israel to do. God is saying, take a long, hard, introspective look at your life and ask yourself if this describes you. Verse 6, you have planted much but harvested little. You eat but never have enough to be satisfied. You drink but never have enough to become drunk. All that is, is God saying, Israel, nothing you've done has worked out the way that you wanted it to. You've been spinning your wheels, you've been working yourself to the bone, and the only thing you have to show for it is exhaustion and burnout and misery. And you're wondering why it hasn't paid off yet. Any of this ringing a bell for anybody? I can tell you this rung my bell when I was reading it. God says, you have planted much but harvested little. That's all that means. You're working harder than you ever have with little to no return on interest. God says, you eat but never have enough to be satisfied. You drink but never have enough to become drunk. That's God telling Israel, listen, your efforts, well, since you've placed yourself in the center of your own life, your efforts to please and satisfy and fulfill yourself have, have left you less pleased less satisfied, less fulfilled than ever. And there's an emptiness that's calling to you. And there's a restlessness that you can't shake. And this is just God saying, how has it worked out for you? This brilliant way of living that you've prescribed for yourself where you're the center instead of me. That's all God's saying to Israel. He's saying, how's it work out when you spend all of your time doing what you wanna do? 
All of your life is dedicated to your personal satisfaction and fulfillment, but when I call you to do something, when I call you to get outside yourself, when I call you to take a risk for me, when I call you to actually serve the people that I've placed in your life with your gifts and your talents, all of a sudden I'm really busy right now. I don't quite have time. Maybe in the next stage of life I will. It's just God saying, how's it work out for you when everything that I give you, you spend on yourself instead of using it to glorify me and help someone else? Is that as satisfying as you promised it would be? I mean, who can't, who can't, if we just get real honest here, who can't look back on a time in your life when you know that you know you were being as self-centered as possible? Who, who looks back on that and says, man, that was great. I should do that more often. That, that was exactly as fulfilling as I promised myself it would be. Of course not, because we're not designed to run that way. God's just laying Israel open like a counselor and saying, think real hard about what you've been doing. It might look a little different to you, but you keep getting the same result. And God says something even more amazing. He tells him the reason for it. He says, I'm the reason for it. Verse 9, he says, you expected much, but then it amounted to little. When you brought the harvest to your house, I ruined it. I, I read that statement, and I thought what it was like to be an Israelite 2,500 years ago and listen to a man named Haggai speak into my life and I knew it was from God and God just said to me personally, he said, I'm the reason that your life is unfulfilling. This is God saying, I am actively opposed to you. This is God saying, it's not one more vacation that you need. It's not an, it's not an addition on your home or a newer car that you need. I have been ruining this for you. I have made sure that it's not satisfying and it's not fulfilling and it's not delivering the way you promised yourself it would. And then he asks and answers his own question in the following verse. He says, why? This is the declaration of the Lord of hosts. Because my house still lies in ruins while each of you is busy with his own house. Think about how sobering that was. I told you there'd be three ideas in this sermon. If you're legitimately interested in rebuilding your life, this is the second non-negotiable if you want to see growth and health in your life this year, and it's this. You will never be where you desire to be until you place God where he deserves to be. There is absolutely no exception to this rule. God just proved it. You will never be where you desire to be until you place God where he deserves to be. And, uh, you know, I'm putting this teaching together and I'm thinking about all the ways, all the areas in my life, all the things that I've dedicated myself to that time after time after time don't deliver for me. And I, and, and I, and I thought, because I know how much that applies to me, I know we're made of the same stuff. And I'm thinking, I wonder who God's gonna bring here that this describes perfectly, where you've been working harder than ever with nothing to show for it but burnout. Or you've been returning to something again and again and again and you keep telling yourself, I know it didn't quite deliver for me last time, but maybe one more will do it. And then that time doesn't satisfy you, so you go back one more time. That's the insanity of the human condition. But listen, I, I, don't need to be, I don't need to be some kind of genius to know this. If anything that God described Israel just now, if anything that God said there is, 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 is manifesting itself in your own life, then it's for the same root cause. If you have the same effect, you have the same cause. If you have the same symptoms as Israel, it's the same cause. It's because somewhere along the way your priorities have gone off. And if you've wondered for some, I bet you there's people in this room that have been living this way for decades and nobody's ever told you this. I'll, I'll, I'll just tell you. It's not because I have it figured out. It's because, it's because God says it in his word. If you're wondering why it doesn't fulfill you, all the, all the things of this world, all the time spent on yourself, all the material possessions, all the sex, all the whatever, if you're wondering why that's done nothing but left you less satisfied than you were before you pursued it, it's because you're trying to satisfy yourself with something that can't satisfy you. That's all it is. And the good news is, God loves you way too much to leave you there. Rest, I mean, you make sure you understand one of the greatest blessings God has ever given me, God has ever given anyone, is dissatis dissatisfaction with life when we attempt to center our lives on anything but God. And let me tell you, if God didn't fill us with a holy dissatisfaction when we lived that way, which one of us would have repented of it? Which one of us would have come, come on home like the prodigal son? Not one of us. But God will fill us with dissatisfaction when something fundamentally is off in your life. If that's you, if I'm speaking to you, then take that as a sign. It's time to adjust your priorities. And in case you think this is just a pastor blowing smoke on Sunday morning, let me appeal to authority here. I'm going to read you a quote from a 1999 Rolling Stone magazine interview with Brad Pitt. Because that's the kind of church we are, I guess. Before I read this, let me, just, let me just make a few comments about our boy Brad. 
if anybody could be satisfied by the things of this world, it'd be Brad Pitt. If anybody's the Olympic champion of living a good life this side of eternity, it'd be Brad Pitt. Okay, let me just be real blunt here. Brad Pitt right now could have a different woman every night of his life until he stops breathing. That's the reality. He's like, the, he's like a, a King Solomon without the wisdom, basically. Solomon says, I mean, serious. Solomon had 300 wives, 700 concubines. Uh, wasn't his, certainly that wasn't his wisest decision. But that's, I mean, that's Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt couldn't go to a corner of this globe and find somebody that didn't recognize him, that didn't want to buy him dinner or buy him a drink or just worship the guy, start weeping at the sight of the guy. And he's basically at a point in his life, like I can't even fathom that kind of money. I guarantee you his great-grandchildren couldn't spend his bank account. If he could have a home in, in all 50 states and whatever country he wants, if you could win life, he's won. So here's how Brad Pitt started off his interview to Rolling Stone in 99. He said, we are heading for a dead end, a numbing of the soul, a complete atrophy of the spiritual being. That strikes me as remarkably inappropriate for a guy living that kind of life if this life can satisfy us, does it not? And I know that must have knocked that interviewer all off his chair when Brad Pitt said that. So he's, you know, floored and he asks him, that's a monumental problem. What's the solution to that? And here's what Brad said. He said, hey man, I don't have those answers yet. You know, when, the first time that I read that, that broke my heart because God's word does have the answer that he's looking for. He said, the emphasis now is on success and personal gain. I'm sitting in it and I'm telling you that's not it. I'm the guy who's got everything, I know. Listen to this. He said, but I'm telling you, once you get everything, then you're just left with yourself. Man, who can't say amen to that? Who here hasn't chased some stupid desire down to its logical conclusion and been left with absolutely nothing but your own stupidity to show for it? He said, I've said it before and I'll say it again. It doesn't help you sleep any better and you don't wake up any better because of it. Now, no one's going to want to hear that. I understand it. I'm sorry I'm the guy who's got to say it, but I'm telling you. What's so deep, what's so unbelievably profound to me about what Brad Pitt just said there is he just proved unequivocally what God said through the mouth of Haggai 2,500 years years ago. That is unbelievable to me. And here it is, the number one way to guarantee you're not satisfied with life, make your own personal satisfaction your number one priority. And I guarantee you, it will, it will prove elusive all the days of your life. Now that's a monumental problem, okay? That's not exactly light and fluffy, like that's sobering, okay? So maybe you're hearing that and you're thinking, man, that's me all over. That's the life I've been living for way too long. Is there any hope for a sinner like me? Praise God, yeah, there is. Because not only does God highlight problems, because he loves us, he highlights solutions. And the solution is found in verse 7. The Lord of hosts says this, think carefully about your ways. He says, go up into the hills, bring down lumber, and build the house. Then I will be pleased with it and be glorified, says the Lord. Let me camp out here for just a minute. All God is saying there, if you miss everything else, but you get this, then get this. All God is saying in those verses is whatever the opposition is, whatever the obstacle is, whatever the resistance is, whatever else you think is competing for your time as the, the, the priority in your life, however difficult it is, leave the life you're living behind. Go into the hills, bring down the lumber, build the house. That's God saying whatever you have to do, prioritize your relationship with me. Now, that's going to look a whole lot different in everybody's life here. I understand that. But generally speaking, there's two kinds of people here today. See, in, in, in a group this size, I can say with total confidence, and this, if nothing else haunts me as a pastor, it's this right here. There's people in this building right now that are not right with God. There's people in this building right now that have no concept of what a relationship with Jesus Christ is like. And I don't know what your plan is for being right with God when you stand before him at the end of your life, but I love you too much to let you walk out of here without telling you there is no peace with God outside of Jesus Christ. If there was any wiggle room there, I'd tell you. But if you want to know what this text looks like as it's applied to your life, if you have yet to personally confess your sins to Jesus and ask him to save you, because it's not about works, it's about putting the works down and saying, Jesus, I need help, I can't save myself. If you haven't done that and you want to get right with God and you want 2016 to be a positive upswing in your life, you start with giving your life to Jesus. And there is always room for one more sinner at his feet. 
If there wasn't, then I certainly wouldn't be saved, but there is. I'm living proof. For, the, for, for other people, you've been saved longer than you can remember, but as this text is brought to bear on your life, you're realizing all the areas that you haven't surrendered to God, all the areas that you've said, God, I'll get to that later, and, and, and you're thinking through that. Listen, what this means is whatever excuse you have to not do what God's calling you to do, it's, it, just see it for what it is, it's weak. It doesn't hold weight. And, and however difficult it is, whatever you think is more important, walk away from it and trust God to meet you as you do. And God says he'll be pleased and he'll be glorified. And spoiler alert, in case nobody's ever told you this, that's the whole reason you and I are still turning oxygen into carbon dioxide. The only reason we continue to have vital signs is to please and glorify the God that made us. Amen? And the, the great irony of life that only the Bible's going to give you is the more you and I get out of our own way and get over ourselves and make this about God, the more pleased with life we inevitably become. Now, this sermon started on a very heavy note. Thankfully, it, it, it ends on an upswing because the nation of Israel responded in exactly the right way. In verse 12, it says, Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, the high priest Joshua, son of Jehozadak, and the entire remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God in the words of the prophet Haggai, because the Lord their God had sent him. So the people feared the Lord. Verse 13, Haggai, the Lord's messenger, delivered the Lord's message to the people. Here it is. Here's the promise for everybody who will repent. Here's the promise for everybody that would exit the life that they're living and say, God, you come first from now on. God says, I am with you. This is the Lord's declaration. And this is our third and final point today. My third and final idea is just this. There, there, will, always, there will always be blessing when we prioritize our relationship with God. The Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All of these things are added to you. And the promise that God's people have is as we put one foot in front of the other, regardless of how much baggage we're carrying around, regardless of how difficult it is, regardless of how many people think we're stupid or naive or whatever, regardless of even the questions that we have that might not immediately get answered, it's not us taking the steps. And if necessary, our God will carry us as we walk in obedience to him. Let me call the worship team up and, and, uh, and we'll shut down today. Um, to close today, I, I just wanna I just want to leave off on a very personal note. I've been... I've been thinking about this and dying to get this off my chest all week. Um, you know, my, probably my greatest fear in life, and I'll elaborate on this, I think probably my greatest fear in life uh, is regret. And what I mean by that is um, I, I really, I can't think of a whole, lot things, a, a whole lot of things worse than laying on my deathbed at the end of my life and knowing that I'm just about ready to stand before God and, and a ra remarkable thing in the Bible, it says that it's going to be a mist. The Bible says our life's like a mist. It appears, it, it vanishes, it's gone. It's so much faster than we ever think it's going to be. My, my greatest fear in life is to be on that deathbed at the end of my life and to feel nothing but regret as I look back on my life because I realize I never did anything that God called me to do. And I kept finding reasons to put him on hold. I was a firefighter for, for four years before I became a pastor, and that singular mindset is what caused me to put in my two weeks because I knew God was calling me to leave that and do this and I was too terrified of what my life would look like and all of the regret that I would have if I put him on hold because I don't know how much more time I have. But for all I know, I've done funerals for 36 year olds. For all I know, this could be my last sermon. For all any of you know, you'll never have a chance to get right with God again other than today. And I can't think of anything worse than laying at the end of my life and looking back and feeling nothing but regret. And, and, and messages like this that God delivered through Haggai, they might be painful, they might be bone rattling, but this is God's way of proactively saving us from that kind of regret later on down the road. He just loves us too much to leave us where we are. Yeah, of course it's painful. Everything that's good for us is painful. Surgery's painful, but it's necessary if we wanna survive. And God, listen to me, God's desire is not that you and I would live lives of regret, but a life of regret is paved with good intentions that never became actions. Everybody hear me on that? A life of regret is paved with good intentions that never became actions. And that's exactly the kind of life that Israel was leading. They were just about ready to get around to making God a priority, to surrendering their lives to God, to getting right with God, to confessing sin, to putting him first. But they were never gonna do it if they kept living like that. And God loved them too much to leave them there. So we delivered this message. Francis Chan said one time, a man I admire, to an unbelievable degree, he said, our greatest fear in life should not be a failure. It should be of succeeding at things in life that don't really matter. And I don't want to succeed at things in life that don't really matter and then be empty-handed in the things of God that are actually going to count 
for eternity. So here's, here's my plan for 2016. I want to be closer to God this year than I have any year of my life. I want to be more pleasing to the God that gives me breath this year than I have any year of my life. And I want to look more like Jesus than I ever have in 2016, than I have any year of my life. And if you're with me, if any of that sounds worth doing, if that's the kind of life that you're interested in living, then dig in with me. Dig into the book of Haggai for the next three weeks. Begin the process of rebuilding and let the word of God shape you, let it break you, let it destroy you and rebuild you if necessary because now is the time to rebuild. Amen? All right, I'll see you in seven days. That's it. That's all.